Hey guys, you're listening to the Tasha Labs podcast, and today we're gonna do something fun. As you know, in the past month, I brought several Web3 project founders onto the podcast to talk about their point of view about Web3 and about their own projects. So that's been exciting for me. But when I brought other people on, obviously I let them talk, right? So I mostly just shut up and listen because the point of having other people on the podcast is not for you to listen to what I have to say. Is for you to listen to what other people have to say. So, but after those episodes, I did get some emails from people asking me, "Hey, Tasha, what do you actually think about these projects?" So that's what we are going to do today. I'm going to tell you exactly what I think about <laughs> those projects. So I had a、uh, three founders on. I had the founders of Say Network, which is a DeFi scaling solution, and we had、uh, Sweatcoin, and we had.、Uh, Uh, Sweatcoin is a move to earn project, and we have Socios, which is a very, very、uh, large fan token platform for sports industry. So I'm going to tell you my opinion about these projects right now, <laughs> at this current stage, as well as the industry that they are in. Okay, and we we can also answer some questions because there are some intelligent questions actually in YouTube that I received. So、uh, that's what we're gonna do. That's the plan for today. But before that, I also want to tell you some, give you some market updates because it's been a very interesting week in the equity market. It's been a lot of drama,、uh, which is quite funny. Well, if you lost money, you probably don't find it funny.、But、anyway, <laughs> so、uh, we we're gonna talk about that and、uh, why why am I focusing on more focusing on the equity market for. For these data, it's not like I'm not like uh, uh, you know, it's not like I don't care about crypto market. Obviously, I care a, a lot, but it's just like、uh, you know, these markets they're all like very interconnected. But the fact is, in the equity market, because it's more mature space, you get a lot more data and a lot more analytics that you can look at compared to crypto, which is actually one of my biggest complaint. It's like crypto need to build better analytics, and actually, I'm working. With some projects in building crypto, like、uh, trading and investing analytics, but that's for another day. Okay, so but、um, so that's what we get. That's the plan for today. I'm gonna share with you some thoughts on the market, what happened in the past week, and then we're gonna dive into <laughs> gossips about the about my podcast guests. Okay. So this past week,、um, remember like a, a week ago that I told you that.、Um, I expected in the very short term we to have more sell off because it's just like there was like really a lot of downward momentum from the week prior, and then I told you that in the middle of the week we 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 were gonna have the CPI data come out, which is gonna be a wild card. If that number, if that print was higher than expected, that may trigger another sell off. So. What happened is well, that's sort of what happened. <laughs> In the beginning of the week, yes, the first three days of the week, you 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 saw some continuous sell off, but nothing nothing dramatic, all right. And then Thursday morning, that was like a really freakish mo- move happened. Is like U.S. CPI number came in, it was slightly higher. Then、uh, consensus forecast and the market gap down, but then immediately rebounded and rebounded so strongly. All right, and it was fast and furious for 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 a full day on Thursday, <laughs> and then Friday, it just like dropped like a rock. It basically gave up all the gains.、Uh, Well, especially Nasdaq, S and P. I don't think S and P gave up all the gains, but Nasdaq gave up pretty much index all the gains that it made on Thursday. So you can see, like, this is what like a bear market does to you. It's like so much volatility and so much volatility for nothing, <laughs> right? So, um, so, 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 what, what do I think about this? These moves, okay. So、uh, where are we in the market? That's that's what I want to、uh, talk about. So the Thursday we had a big bounce.、Um, I was kind of expecting that we're gonna have some consolidation on Friday, but I didn't expect that we're gonna have like such a big sell off immediately on Friday. So do I do I do I think so? So remember the week before I also thought I also told you that my baseline hypothesis, my thesis right now is like. We may be, 
we are going to maybe see a local bottom sometime in October or early November, right? So that is still my baseline thesis right now. But is this the is this the local bottom that I was talking about? I don't think so. <laughs> so uh, why do I not think so? Because it just does not look like. Okay, those the Thursday we had a big bounce, but it was really if you look at the how many stocks that actually went up, right? Because the index is only uh, S and P five hundred. As, as the name tells you, it was only 500 stocks, right? And, and, and NASDAQ index is uh, however many there is. So it, it's, it's really just a, a compilation of relatively, uh, you know, longer lasting and uh, smaller, like bigger, bigger stocks. So if you look at, if you count the numbers, it's only about 8% of stocks that went up, like uh, to a significant extent. Not like went up a little bit, but to a significant, to a threshold extent, about 8% of stocks. Okay. On Thursday, which is not what you would uh, want to see if if there is a actually like a sustained broad based rally, because there were like a, close to seven thousand stocks in the U.S. equity market. Okay, so and then you know in so so typically, typically when you see like kind of uh, a more broad based rally that will last for a period of time. You was, I think you you would see a higher per percentage, at least you know ten, if not fifteen percent of the stocks, it should be making a move when the index goes up. So, um, so that that's that's just not not a not a good sign to me. Like, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, you know, um, whether we are at a local bottom a lot. I I think the answer is no. <laughs> Uh, like for example, in like uh, March 2020, you when 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 the market rebounded from March low in uh, two years ago, you had like over a thousand stocks um, that had a significant moves in a single day for like multiple days straight. So you can go back to check the data yourself. Okay, so um, either a thousand or around 900 stocks going up like a. Uh, or the technical people will call it breakout. <laughs> okay, so it, but the bottom line is I don't see a broad-based movement, and uh, um, and also if you if 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 this is a real turn in the market, I think you guys see some like people start freaking out and people start say okay gotta gotta get jump in get it get get in on the on the on the bull train right in in other words FOMO but you are you seeing that no <laughs> so there's no like a buying like a, you see that like Thursday made a bit move and then Friday completely just uh, you know wiped out that move altogether so what so so where do we go going forward right now I, I don't really have a big <laughs> baseline for what's going to happen for the next month because like the next Fed meeting going to be in two months uh, in two weeks sorry in um, beginning of November and then we have the midterm on November 8th uh, which is the U.S. midterm election so those are typically the catalyst events for the market right so um my my so so my baseline is we may just continue seeing continuous very choppy very volatile actions, like similar to what you saw, but maybe to a less, to less dramatic extent, to last Thursday and Friday, um, and maybe there will be more selling, but it doesn't just it, it just does not look like a local bottom yet to me. <laughs> so uh, medium term, nothing has changed. You know, we are in a down cycle, and I expect the market will go down more. <laughs> So, uh, but if you're, you know, uh, taking, trying to go like either long or short side, maybe I would say this is not a time to go all in on either side because you may just get chopped out on either side for the next couple of weeks. So that's what I think <laughs> about the market right now. Uh, yeah. Okay. So now let's get to some fun stuff. Let's talk about 
the project. So I'm gonna go reverse chronological order. I'm gonna talk about the. I'm gonna talk about socials, and then Sweatcoin, and then uh, say, okay. So I had Alex Dreyfus, who is the founder of Socios, which which is the largest sports fan token network in the world today, on the podcast. So. You know, the, the the reason I'm interested in the project is obviously I'm looking for like all sorts of projects that has real world economic connections. And this is one of those. Okay. So, but I also, in my previous article about fan tokens, my point of view, like my assessment about these fan tokens is like, it's promising but I'm not seeing product market fit yet. I'm not seeing enough utilities or enough functions or enough enough killer apps, quote unquote, about these fan tokens yet. But it's promising because they've done something really incredible. They've signed up like basically the, the top tier sports teams in Europe and in the US too, they're partnering with NFL and NBA. Okay, so this is something really, really hard to pull off. And since they have the, the, this partnership network, that is a incredible moat, really, for anybody else who wants to get into this market to catch up. So if they can find some kind of product market fit, which I'm optimistic because, again, this boils down to the people behind the thing, behind the project, okay? I'm, I'm very impressed by Dreyfus, actually, because, um, again, you just, like, uh, you, you, you look, at, look at what they have done in the past few years. It's like they pull off some really, really hard things, okay? And they've been, like, uh, going at it for several years. So they have the same power, and they have the effectiveness to actually get things done. So. Those are things that you want to look for, the qualities you want to look for in a founder, right? So, and also in that episode, I mentioned like, I wrote that fan token article and half an hour later, I got a message from Dravis. So this is something like, you know, like when you look at, like people all tell you, okay, you've got to invest in founders, right? You've got to invest in people, people is the most important asset, but what kind of people are you investing in? You want to invest in this kind of people because it's like uh, uh, you, you, you just like this kind of responsiveness and efficiency <laughs> really impressed me, all right? And then after, after that interview, actually, um, even before my assistant shared that interview on, on Twitter or on my website, he himself shared, shared that episode, <laughs> uh, which is very funny. But, you know, but my opinion about fan tokens hasn't changed. Uh, you know, after that conversation, my opinion is still, you know, no product market fit just yet. Um, but I think they have enough traction going on. They have enough good things going on to allow them to tinker, to create something useful out of this um, that, that can create some kind of network effect. So that is the unfair advantage that other projects, most of the other projects in this space, you know, fan space, fan token or kind of uh, social token, most of those projects don't have, right? It's this this kind of unfair advantage is what you want to look for in projects. So, um, and really, it, it, if, if you're, you know, I'm again, I'm not very impressed about their app, app. not yet. <laughs> I think it's the app user experience is pretty terrible. And then, um, but that's what happens in, in, in early stage projects, right? It's, it's an exploratory process until you find something that, 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 that works, that sticks. And really, when you have excellent people, people is the most important thing. That's why the Silicon Valley VCs they invest in repeat, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, veteran uh, entrepreneurs because they have had the track record of getting things done, right? Even if they don't have a clear idea of what what's what their next project is going to be, because you you can you can be rest assured that excellent people they will make something excellent happen. They will even make mediocre ideas happen. You know there are a lot of projects 
a lot of uh, examples of really mediocre ideas, including like social media, you know? Zuckerberg started Facebook, but how many social media has been started? How many social media has have been started before Facebook? A lot of them. And they all have like kind of similar ideas. So the idea itself is not like groundbreaking, okay? And also you look at, um, what are some other examples? Medium, for example, Substack. You know, those are not new ideas, so, you know, blogging platform or newsletter platform. <laughs> Many people before that, before them, they have tried the same idea. Okay. So it's really, who are doing it, it makes, it makes a huge difference. So, so that's, that's, what, that's what I think about, about this project. Um, the funny thing is, after, <laughs> after this, this episode is posted, Bunch of people, if you if you check the, the comment section of the YouTube channel, of my YouTube channel for this episode, you see a bunch of people shilling this one project in the comment section. This there, There's a project uh, that sells like, uh, it's a platform for athlete tokens, right? Lots of people shilling that project in the comment, which is really funny. I'm like, hmm, maybe next time I, I you know, maybe at next time I should try deleting all the shills in the comment. Wouldn't that be fun? Um, when I see a lot of, when I see an army of shills early on for a project, I'm like both impressed and alarmed. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, so, but the thing is, you know, we we actually talk about these uh, influencer, athlete, or social tokens um, on that on that episode with with uh, uh, Alex Travers, right? So his his opinion, if you listen to that episode, is is that these tokens that are actually associated with a specific person, they're like more, they're less, they're less less um, less feasible. I would say it's not like they won't work, but it's like, you know, people retire, people die and, you know, a athlete, they don't, they only have a career of, you know, 10, 15, 20 years and that's it. Right. So what happens when they retire? Does your asset or token or M NFT specifically tied to those people still going to be worth something? And uh, how much is that going to be worth? Right. There are, yes, sports legend or entertainment legend, the legendary lives on beyond their life, but those are few and far between, right? And that does not, that the, the number of those people, you, you can count like, uh, you know, with uh, two or three digits <laughs> in the sports industry, the entire history of sports or entertainment, right? So uh, is that going to be sustain? Is is that going to be the uh, the sustainable number for a platform that's specifically dedicated to that type of token? I don't know. I think that's a huge question mark. Okay. And also on the the, the second point is uh, these utilities tied to these influencer tokens. Typically, right now they're saying, okay, you get merch, you get like uh, maybe like a screen time, like a group social uh, group meet and greet with your with, with that athlete or with that influencer those are fine but those don't scale those utilities don't scale and and by the way the fan tokens uh for sports clubs they have the same problem that's why i say they don't have the product market fit yet okay they don't those utilities don't scale right so um <laughs> so so that's why i'm like mm, Pretty, pretty, pretty big question mark for me. All right. So, um, same thing with not just athlete tokens for like social tokens, um, specifically tied to a influencer or a creator. I have the same question about these tokens. These are the, you know, I, I just don't see the longevity basically of those tokens and the utility of those tokens. Are, if if they if they, these tokens exist and in the bull market will they pump? I think they will pump pretty hard <laughs> because of the influence and the distribution. If you're if you're Kim Kardashian and imagine 
there's a Kim token, all right? <laughs> Kim Kardashian token gonna pump pretty, pretty huge, I, I imagine, because he, she has the distribution. But it, at the end of the day, does, does that token gonna amount to anything of sustaining value? I'm not sure. This is the same reason, you know, there are actually there there has been several projects that approach me like about these social tokens they like want me to invest in their project or want me to invest my own token or nft you know so 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 the thing is i i could issue a tasha coin for example or a nft membership which is like a lot of these uh, platforms um, these days, that's that's what they're selling for, right? Create an NFT with us, uh, get membership tokens with us. The thing is, the thing is, when when I look at these projects, first of all, for this new new type of uh, like a creator token type of pro product to to take hold, so like a, I see it as a new product category, you gotta be. 10 times or 100 times better than existing solutions for something like that brand new to take hold, which not just apply to crypto, apply to any new product, right? So, but if you look at, if I want to build a membership, I have like existing solutions, pretty easy to use. I can just sell a subscription <laughs> and I can sell a membership web two way, right? Why do I need an N NFT? I would need an NFT if I want to do like one off fundraise, raise a lot of money up front um, so that I can get a capital to, to, to build something or build a project. But if it's just like a normal like creator selling content or selling, you know, um, like athlete or entertainer, I don't see a huge need for that one, like a front loaded capital the need for, 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 for fundraise to be front loaded. So subscription model do, it does better and you already have subscri subscription based solution and a lot of them in the web, web two world. So what is the additional value added with a, you know, Tasha coin or a Tasha NFT <laughs> membership? I don't, I don't see enough of that. And also like there are people who say, okay, you can keep a portion of trading fees as, as creator. Yeah, but it's it's not as predictable as subscription. I still, you know, to me, I can just sell a subscription. That would be better if I want to sell a subscription, which is, by the way, Tasha Coin is not coming anytime soon. Okay. <laughs> In case you're wondering, um, exactly because because I have these uh, I I have these uh, questions about about this this type of applications for NFT. Okay. Or you can say, okay, with NFT, you can control the membership that you issue. You can have scarcity. Yeah, that, that is a feature, but do you really, how many creators really need that though? For the, like a digital creator, all right? If I have a, want a membership, I sell a membership, I want as, as, much, as many subscriptions as, as, as I can get, typically, right? What is the value of controlling that scarcity? So those are my questions. <laughs> so about these these type of athlete social like influencer tokens, I think they will pump if we have a bull market, but I really don't I don't see the product market fit, basically. So so this is somewhat different if if you're an artist. You see, the, the kind of like the artwork NFT, I think that does have some like a sufficient product market fit. That is a legit use case for NFT because again, you, you want this use case, this new product, it should have like 10 X or hundred X better than the existing solution. So if you look at, if you're an artist, you sell a painting, all right? So what is the traditional way to do it? You can, you can sell it locally. You can go to a gallery. You, if you sell it digitally, there's some, not like a very easy proof of ownership and what exactly are you selling? <laughs> in that case, right? So NFT gives like a, it's a, like a digital ownership of art. And you, now you have like a global reach for your art and you have a very, you have an easy way. Well, there are some glitches with NFT, but at least it's like a, a lot better than your existing solution of selling art and, and, and providing like art ownership proof. Right? So I see, so I see that as a legit application of NFT in terms of art 
in terms of artists selling their artwork. That is a legit application that I see as ha have already got sufficient product market fit. But these social tokens, not yet. <laughs> okay. um, and and, and I, I think really what's lacking maybe, okay, another thought is maybe what's lacking is, is user experience, is the kind of uh, experience that would really go beyond a Web2 membership. But at the same time, it needs to be scalable. What does that look like? I don't exactly know, but I know there are projects that are working on this front. Okay. And some of them are gonna be big. So I'm actually gonna bring a, a project that are working on that, like NFT platform with like great user experience. Um, this, this, it's a project called OP3N to come to talk about their project in the next couple of weeks or so. Okay. So I'm looking forward to that. So that's that about Socius. <laughs> and then Swagcoin. Uh, this one is funny uh, because there are a bunch of people complaining in the YouTube comment, uh, quote, this one from Crypto Cat. This is cash grab. It's Web2 company with a loyalty system. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Of course, it's a Web two company with a. That's that's the whole point. It's like, you you have like with with Web three, you kind of you you give your loyalty system liquidity, and that opens the door to a whole new set of possibilities. The Web two loyalty program that does do not give you, okay. So, and but but the Web two companies they have real products, they have real users token the token itself is not real the 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 product so uh they have the product they have users they have distributions when you merge these two these kind of web 2.5 projects that's why i you know one of my thesis about next leg of crypto adoption is web 2.5 type of projects will drive adoption because they have the distribution they have the product the viable products lot of them right and then you adopt a web3 like a tokenization model that becomes a growth driver for the project so when the two marry together there are a lot of magic that can happen that's why I'm you know bullish on lots of these uh, web 2.5 type of projects so uh, Sweatcoin <laughs> what do I think about Sweatcoin so you, you see, these guys, they've been at it for a long time. They, they're in existence since 2016, okay? And they've grown really a, a very large user base, obviously. Um, it's probably larger than, I would say, 99% of crypto projects to date that you would see, right? Uh, even though they, they only just launched a token. And, you know, the founders saw uh, committed, they're thoughtful, they're capable, they, you know, <laughs> uh, they, they, they know what their visions are, where, where they're headed, and they are able to execute. Again, this is like they already have like six years of track record, right? So, and then they, they basically, it's a web 2.5 <laughs> in the sense that they really are bridging the gap between the advertisers in the web 2 world and this business model to drive growth using tokenization. Um, and to and their specific model is move to earn, right? So, um, but on the other hand, <laughs> it doesn't mean that this is like guaranteed success, right? Um, on the other hand, what I'm kind of looking at, what I, what, what I have questions about, right? Those things I, I think will be challenging for them potentially is that if, even though they have a very large user base for their web to like a, for their like a, a sweatcoin app okay um, which is a different app compared to the sweat app that they just launched which is like a um, on-chain tokenite with with on-chain um, tokens um, they, even though they have a large user base I do not yet see a huge network effect um, because you can, they, they had a large user base because they, they hit on something that they, they're solving a real problem and 
nobody else was doing something crazy like that five years ago, right? But people caught on, and today if you go to the app store, you will see quite a few, including Stepin, you know, which is one of their competitors, um, and 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 a lot of others are thinking of doing something similar. So, but where is the network effect? I don't yet see because you you can you know you can you can spin up another app, and you count count the steps and give people a token to drive to drive uh, adoption and you, you your selling point could be oh if you you know again the same story for all crypto projects <laughs> uh, be a early adopter get in early so um, so that you can reap the most reward so if if other move to earn similar move to earn apps are to launch that would be their narrative right Getting early and buy our token and you reap the most reward. That would be other projects, the, the narrative other projects can use to drive their initial adoption. But beyond that, where does that additional growth come from? You would need some sort of network effect. You would need significant moat. That moat can come from, you know, you build integrations with other applications. Uh, you build, I don't know, social features that draw people in with their own network of friends and families. Uh, you provide and more entertain more entertainment value in the application so that people have to use it <laughs> on a frequent basis. You improve the u user experience. Maybe you get better product partnerships when you get bigger. So those can be the potential ways that you can build network effect when you when you are bigger, right? But right now I don't yet see <laughs> a very strong moat from Sweatcoin, okay, to be honest. So, um, but this is something that they, they are working on, obviously. But uh, but that's, that is the question at the back of my mind. Because you, you see some, the, the, the thing is, I just posted post on Twitter, this, like when you have a large user base, it's not necessarily true that you have a network effect or a large moat, which means other people can copy your idea pretty easily and, and get up to speed pretty easily if they offer some incremental improvement on the product. You see plenty of examples on this in any industry. Um, for example, um, what would be a good example? Oh, um, <laughs> Blue Apron, you heard of Blue Apron? It's this um, uh, this company that offers meal meal kit, basically you, you deliver to people like on a subscription basis, like food uh, ingredients to allow them to cook the meal so they don't have to go grocery shopping, right? So that idea, when the company first started a few years ago, that was a huge hit. They were like a high growth company. Um, but then, and, and they're a public company today. But, but, but then what happens is you get a lot of so many copycats, right? Like uh, there are so many meal delivery and food, like not food delivery, but just like a meal kit delivery companies today. And everybody's offering something different, like offering organic or vegan or, you know, I don't know, keto, <laughs> whatever kind of meal kit that they offer or they offer a price uh, discount because they figure out some, some better way to, to, to run their logistics. So then you see like Blue Apron's revenue hasn't grown in the past uh, two, three, or even four years, really, even though they had a really a head start at the beginning. So that's the danger, you know, when you, have, when you are a high growth company, you hit on, you, because you hit on a, a great idea and you execute it. But if you, at the end of the day, don't have that moat, that's what happens. <laughs> Other people caught on. You you just like uh, create a bunch of uh, competitors for yourself. So that is the question. Like to me, as an investor, I would need a better answer on. But you know, uh, I'm sure that's something they have thought of and they're working on it. <laughs> so uh, next one, uh, say, all right. So I had a. Uh, Jay, which is the co-founder of Saint Networkon, say is this uh, layer one chain, B 
build on Cosmos that is specifically it's like high performance chain for DeFi applications for scalable DeFi applications. Okay. So this one is interesting. You, I actually like uh, there are some like intelligent questions. <laughs> Uh, intelligent questions on this episode. There's this uh, this one from Ma- Matasuki. They said, "So, it how is? I, I'm I'm guessing is that if if uh, if conge- congestion, uh, network congestion is a problem, why not build a side chain on other layer ones? Uh, how is this better than Robinhood? At least." Uh, with Robinhood, you don't have all the bulky computations. I'm failing to see the use case of a chain only for trading when other chains have achieved this already. And then uh, for say to work, you will need bridges. Um, why would, uh, you know, basically other applications take the trouble to bridge to the the other like a real like a multi-purpose layer ones which is where the users are so basically the point is uh for say to work you need bridges and bridges are a pain in the ass (laughs) and then there's a question from there's coming from give peace a chance (laughs) and this person said the most ridiculous stuff i've ever heard (laughs) It's not even a real layer one. Uh, X, Y, Z chain. So this, I'm filling the blank, your favorite layer one. Okay, I'm gonna not going to say this name. Has subsequent finality and can process many more TPS than say. <laughs> okay, all right. So basically the complaint is that this project, like, how can you how can you have a chain that is a st- standalone DeFi chain? Because DeFi is at the end of the day a supporting sector, support other sector, uh, support other on-chain activities. So you need to be where the users are, right? It's like uh, New York or London or Singapore, they're financial centers, but they cannot be just financial centers uh, disconnected from the rest of the economy. You cannot have the financial center in in the middle of uh, the desert where nobody can get there. <laughs> uh, that's not how finance works, right? Finance is a supporting sector of uh, other parts of the economy. So that's that person's point. Is like, you have to if you have to bridge to other chains, why? What's the point? Why don't you just build DeFi apps on other chains that has multi-purpose chains that have like where the real users and and the blockchain economies are. Um, so that's a you know legit valid uh, point. And the other point is, uh, uh, say it says it's very fast, but there are other chains that are very fast too. <laughs> so what is really the differentiating factor? So those are all like pretty good questions. I you know I would say those those are my questions as well, I, I, which I will talk about in a sec. Okay. But first of all, why I was interested in in bringing say on the podcast is because this is a legit big problem that they're solving, which is DeFi today is pretty unusable. If you are beyond like doing like a one transactions once in a while, (laughs) uh, it's pretty unusable. It's really, really bad user experience. I cannot tell you how many times I lost count. Okay. At least three or four. I had near heart attack. (laughs) <laughs> trying to execute transactions on some decks because it, and then it got dropped or it told me it went through but it didn't it, it's like a nightmare <laughs> situation if you need it for some kind of short-term trading that you need to capture is like there is a very short-term short window of opportunity that you're trying to capture that is like the situation that you're really like pulling your hair out <laughs> okay, so uh, the infrastructure of De- and this is not the fault of any specific DeFi apps for a lot in a lot of situations is because the underlying uh, blockchain 
a problem. So really, the infrastructure needs, needs a lot of work for DeFi to be scalable. So I see Say as solving a big problem <laughs> for many kinds of DeFi applications. So that's why you know I'm, I'm interested in this project. And also, it's because I, I was also impressed by how much traction they, 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 could, they were able to pull off in, with a short, short period of time because they are not the first chain that claim to be serving DeFi. They're not the first DeFi layer one chain, okay? There, there, there are, you know, I, at least a handful <laughs> that I know of. <laughs> That's been around for quite, quite, quite some time. But they, they were able to get some traction pretty quickly and had some really interesting projects on board. For example, they had this, um, um, they had this uh, Solana VM, a Solana um, a layer two, <laughs> built this project called the uh, Nitro, uh, build on uh, Cosmos. So like a really interesting project. I actually, I'm gonna have the phone around like uh, maybe next month on the, uh, on the podcast to talk about their project, okay. Um, but they're building on say so it's like hmm they they're these these guys they they can they can execute <laughs> that's my point um and uh, also you know in terms of one of the questions that that the youtube comment um, person raised why why do you need why do you need a chain like specifically for DeFi? because you know you have sufficient number of applications in the DeFi space that you it, it's it may be worthwhile to build specific infrastructure that cater to that type of financial applications because it's it's one of the biggest applications sectors in web3 today it's going to continue to be because web3 is a you know huge part about financialization tokenization of everything right so so DeFi is always going to be a huge part of it, and this sector terribly, terribly need a scaling solution. So, I do see the space for 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 having you know layer one type of infrastructure specifically catering to the DeFi space. So I I, I think that's a legit value prop, okay? That a multi-purpose layer one like Solana, for example, may not be in the best place to provide. But then you can say, okay, can you do a roll up on Ethereum? Can you do kind of any kind of layer two solutions, uh, so on and so forth? So yes, of course you can, and people do. Okay. But again, this is like what they're trying to build is like infrastructure specifically catering to DeFi so that you do not have to roll your infrastructure, or at least uh, the project don't have to spend so much time building their you know, blockchain infrastructure, which is really another different task, right? So as the space develop, I think you're gonna see more labor distribution, <laughs> more like uh, as the economy gets more complex, for, this is true for any economy, as the economy gets more complex, you have more fine-tuned sectors in the economy, more specialization, right? So in a hunter-gathering society, you do not have lawyers or insurers or doctors or, you know, maybe you have like one or two people in the tribe that take care of all, of all of those things. They do multiple of those things. But in the modern economy, you have specific professions, specific um, industries that specialize in that, you know, a very niche thing. Same thing in the Web3, in the Web2 space, right? You look at SaaS products, for example, it gets like a more and more niche and more and more specialized by the year. <laughs> so uh, that's what happens when you have a more complex economy. So that I, I think I do see the space for something like this, for something like say, to have its own legit value proposition beyond what a multi-purpose layer one or layer zero chain can provide. Okay. So that's the same. And re, but regarding, so, and, and this is not just about speed of, of the chain. It's all, also about other like DeFi specific customization that the infrastructure needs to provide. 
So that's that. But then you know, I do agree with this one of these uh, comments. It says, you know, you 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 have to if you're not located already on a multi-purpose layer one chain. That means people need to bridge to you. <laughs> Okay. There needs to be some kind of cross-chain messaging, cross-chain bridging, and that is a that is a like kind of a bottleneck today because that space is quite weak, is 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 not very developed compared to the rest of the blockchain economy, but that space is growing, it's developing. Okay, so uh, a lot of projects are working on cross-chain messaging and stuff. Because again, you will have like as the economy grows more complex, you're gonna need more traffic channels across chains, and as these chains become more specialized, you will also need like a bigger need for cross-chain messaging, cross-chain transactions. So those gonna be th these cross-chain protocols will be its own, will be its own sector, and it's gonna be a big sector. That's that's my view. Um, and the fact that you know things say is building on Cosmos, right? So you already reduced that risk, that cross-chain risk to some extent, or that infrastructure cost to some extent, because you already, like for projects that's already building in Cosmos, you have the IBC, uh, which like an inter-blockchain uh, uh, communication protocol, right? You already have, like Cosmos already have that, so that already like reduced the cost and increase the security for cross-chain communication, at least within the Cosmos ecosystem. So, and Cosmos is showing some sign of life. <laughs> uh, it's, it's actually a growing ecosystem. So who knows, you know? I think they, they picked a good, uh, they picked a good uh, ecosystem as a, as a starting off point. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, <laughs> for any infrastructure projects, uh, you can talk all day long about the merits, uh, the technical merits. Oh, we are fast. We are, uh, you know, a sub-second finality or whatnot. <laughs> or we are decentralized, uh, whatever points that you're selling. At the end of the day, adoption is king, right? Uh, at the end of the day, you gotta have, uh, did, you, you win when, when projects actually use, we use your, uh, use your infrastructure. So, so that's what, Initially, I found this project intriguing. Is like they were able to onboard a bunch of uh, actually a very high quality projects in a short period of time. So that tells me there's something special <laughs> about this project, right? Um, so, so, but you know, this is like also a funny thing is it's, it's like similar to countries because you, if you listen to if you read my other previous uh, writing, you know, like. A analogy that I gave about like blockchain infrastructure. This is like digital economy, digital countries, right? Countries in the digital on the internet. So, but you know, similar. All the countries they would tell you, <laughs> oh, we are very business friendly. Come invest in our country. <laughs> you go to talk to any you know prime minister or a finance minister. They would tell you, oh, we are the best. We provide you X Y Z. You know. Just like come build with us, come build on our territory. Okay, everybody tells you that, but somehow, some countries, they're just way better <laughs> at attracting investment than others. It's so, it's like uh, the 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 devil's in the details, <laughs> right? Everybody can claim that they are business friendly and they are um, have a great environment for companies to grow, but really at the end of the day. It boils down to the people who are running the show in that country, and they are able to attract interest from the outside, attract builders, essentially companies, builders, projects, to 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 thrive in their territory. So, yeah. So some countries they just they have that magic. Others they just go through the motions. So. You, you want to find the projects, the digital economies that have that kind of magic. Uh, that is the ongoing quest as an investor. So, but anyway, um, that's, uh, that's about it for today. So if you are listening to this on Apple Podcast, uh, please go to the podcast app on your phone. 
search for Tasha Labs and leave a review. Okay, that will help more people discover this podcast and help me spread the message about Web three, about the you know disruptions, the innovations that Web three can bring to the economy. I firmly believe Web three is going to change the world. It's going to revolutionize how values are distributed in the economy, and that's why I'm so fascinated about space. And I want to educate more people about the space beyond just、uh, you know hoping the tokens price go up. <laughs> so help me do that. Okay, go leave a review on Apple,、um, and、uh, I will talk to you next time. Bye.